So we're here doing like a mini grill moment with uh, Ryan Kavanaugh, the CEO and founder of Relativity, because it is your 10th birthday and happy anniversary for that. Thank you. Especially since you showed up to our fifth birthday, we figured we should show up to your 10th birthday. We appreciate it very um, much. So we're just it's not my personal 10th birthday, it's the company's, but I'm probably turning That's what I mean. I'm 11 or 12. I would, yeah, well, we're talking emotionally or like, emotionally. From a, yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. But well, it is, well, that's a good way to start because actually, I mean, Relativity is so um, identified with you as the brand. And I'm sure that you feel that after 10 years of building the company, um, it has its own ethos and it has its own culture. Uh, walk us through a little bit of like, of, of why you started and how you started and where. Wow, that's a lot of question. Um, well, okay, so I started Relativity, obviously, 10 years ago, 2004. And really, it came, originally came just from a, I don't want to call it a fluke, but really seeing a void between, at the time, it was really producers and companies that were not um, necessarily in the production world needing to connect capital with production. So it started with um, putting together some independent production deals purely from a financial um, basis. And there, the issue was that people in Hollywood and people in Wall Street didn't talk the same language. So there was no real bridge between that. Um, and then that led, led to a really our first really big deal was for was creating Marvel's um, entire studio. So originally Marvel was a licensing deal where they a licensing company they'd license their toys, all of Spider Man to Sony, mm -hmm. and so they were looking. Um, you know they're kind of out there saying we just made fifty million dollars on Spider Man while Sony just made a billion. Like we got we got to figure out how to own movies, mm -hmm. and so that was really. So you put the <laughs> financing together. Not just the financing. The financing was actually, I shocked you that one was the easy part. It was the structure. Because the other thing that Marvel was saying is, by the way, we're not going to take any capital risk on investing in movies. As a public company, we've told our shareholders we won't. So it was both, we want to become owners of these movies, but we won't put any money up. So we had to actually find a way to, you know, to bridge that gap, which was using the, um, the Marvel IP to the characters themselves as, as, val as value, collateral? as their, their investment. Mm -hmm. So that kind of put us on the map. And I think then what really happened is there was just a huge void in the Hollywood marketplace of people who could go in and talk structured finance and talk, you know, balance sheets and P&L. So then we did, um, you know, co-financing with Universal and Sony and Warners. and. Um, did, when you started the company, did you think you were going to be a financing company or did you think you were going to be a multi-purpose studio with, on every platform, movies, television, music, games? You know, I don't, we never sat back at the time and said we're going to just be on every platform. But when we started the company, the, the concept was... Some, some of those platforms didn't exist right, in 2004 didn't even exist. anyway, so... Right, it was more just content. I, I always lived in this and the content was, is king. And I believe that more and more now every day. And so I think at the end of the day, it was owning content originally through kind of a financing perspective, then going into a production ownership, meaning where it wasn't just owning pieces of other people's movies, but actually creating our own. Um, and the whole idea was every time we learned a little bit about the business, one thing that was certain is this business is 100 years old and it hasn't changed. And so every time you kind of unveiled that curtain, there's this you know, wizard back there who's really 110 years old and going, I, I don't know how to do it differently. And so that's what we took advantage of, was every time we'd learn how they were doing it, there was just so much inefficiency. We'd say, well, we can just apply basic principles and do it a little bit better. So the end of it was anything that's content ownership, um, if we could do it more efficiently, we, we, we try. So I, I have said this many times, I will say it again. If I had a nickel for every time somebody told me that this company was going under, I would have a mountain of nickels on my desk. Um, me too. Yeah. <laughs> and yet you're still standing. And in fact, your company's expanding and we're in your beautiful new offices where maybe they're not quite so new, but they're Thank you. New-ish, yes, lovely. Um, so what, give me the, what's the disconnect there between um, Ryan's building a company, we like him, but we don't understand how he's succeeding and he's not going to succeed, and yet the company continues to grow. Sure. I think it's really simple, which is, um, you know, if you're doing something new, um, I know the word innovation gets thrown around a lot, but if you are doing something innovative, it means no one's done it before and no one's thought about it before, which means it's going to inherently... Um, upset a system and it's going to have people saying well that can't work because otherwise we would have what done you're it. doing that's new is has to do on the fine the structure the, struct the, the financing structure you put together on selling movies I mean it's all the above I mean for example it, it goes from how we finance movies um, the risk we take on movies to the acting deals we do to the way we distribute to I mean give an example okay well an example on a movie like, before we start on a movie we're in the profits or break even that's from our output that's deals. a rule 
I mean, no, that's, that's sort our, of like a that's principle. How, that is how our, our business works. We have output deals, so it's not even a choice. It just happens that way. So people don't understand that. And our target market is to make well, money. Well, one second. Let's not be causing to other people the business. Everybody does output deals. Everybody has no. foreign financing deals. No, no, is that no, what no. you mean? No, people do foreign pre-sales. Yes. We have output deals in 117 countries. We don't have to go What's out and say. What's the difference? Well, an output deal means you have a movie that you want to make. You hire a sales agent. That sales agent goes and calls up six distributors and says, we pay $500,000 for your territory. We have output deals, meaning that in 117 countries, our partners, they're all five to seven year contracts, have to take every movie we make, and we have to give them every movie we make, and it's at a pre-agreed percentage of the budget. So there's no sales, there's no maybe, if, ands, or buts. It's just, we, if we decide to make a movie, it's covered from foreign. So what people don't understand is our U.S. is profit for us. U.S. and China, because obviously we have our Chinese operation and something soon to be announced in another territory. But um, Bigger but, than China? I don't know if No, 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 no. Not, definitely not bigger <laughs> than China. But, um, but no, so that's it. That's our, 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 our model. That's your model. So, so, you, so we look to do movies that make, the other thing is we make movies in the tw that do 20 to 60 million in the box. And the reason I say they look to do 20 to 60, of course, if a movie's going to do 200. U U.S.? U.S., right. Mm -hmm. Of course, if a movie's going to do 150, you know, and you could do it with a, a good, you know, low budget, of course, you're not going to turn it down. But what we do is where the other studios are spending 50, 60, 70 million dollars marketing movies to get all four quadrants in because they need all those ticket sales. We just, we spend enough to get to the, our target consumer. So we'll spend 25 or 30 million saying this movie is really made for males on, under 25. On marketing. On marketing, on mm -hmm. P&A. Mm -hmm. And so then what that ultimately does is we get our core audience into the movie. We do 20 to 60 in the box. Sometimes it's crossover to two audiences. And then we are now the number one perform. not now, we have been for three years, the number one performing studio in home video. So our home video is 1.35 as a percentage of Blu-ray to global sales. The next highest is Disney. They're 1.33, but that's because of Aladdin, uh, Little Mermaid, and Lion King. You go, but really, they'd be at 1.12, 1.13. You're talking about DVD sales? Yeah. What are you talking about? DVD sales. So our DVDs, we sell, uh, we sell almost two to one. Uh, so our movies that are doing 50, are actually performing on DVD like they're doing 100 or 150. And we're, we're growing every year 20% in DVD. You're growing 20% Everybody else is shrinking 3 to 10%. Why is that? It's a, because I know the, why they're shrinking. Why are you growing? Uh, because of the way, again, that we make movies. So by target marketing to this you know, particular consumer group, so let's say there's a movie that maybe women would go see if we really market it to them. Maybe, let's say, women over 35 would normally go see it. Maybe we could get them in if we went and bought a lot of media. Well, you want to take a, one, of your, one of your most more recent movies? Today. Okay, let's take, um, we'll take Safe Haven. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a, clearly a movie made for women. We didn't market it to men at all. So our, our P&A budget on that movie was, was targeting to, be, to go after women, young and old women, that's it, period. Whereas if we were with a major studio, which Nick has had many movies with major studios, they would have spent, to our 35, they would have spent 60 or 65. So instead, now we have these two quadrants that go in and say, hey, we really like that movie. Had we like forced guys to go to it by marketing in their face, they're like, oh, I gotta go see this movie, they would have said we hated it. And you would have mm -hmm. gotten no DVD sales, and you would have gotten very few of them in anyway. So ultimately, what we then do is take that good word of mouth that comes from the groups that like it. Who are young <laughs> women buying DVDs? I don't know any. They're on Netflix. They're on Hulu. Yeah, you're talking about we're in Los Angeles. Los Angeles and, and New York aren't the real world. I mean, there's still, look, the DVD market, if you ask the other studios, they'll say it's not shrinking. It's, it is shrinking 3 to 10% every year. Mm -hmm. We just happen to be growing on our titles because we really focus on, you, we don't rush them into the theaters. We, we actually allow those people who would go to the theaters the way to find it, and then they talk positively about it. So, we, so it's not just DVD, it also translates. Our TV sales, meaning free TV, are about somewhere between 15 and 20% higher than the industry average. And our digital transactions are between two and seven times. So where we shine on our movies, and that's what people don't understand, is in everything below box office. That's one part of our model. So, mm -hmm. Are movies still <clears throat> the biggest chunk of, of um, Relativity's they're business? They're the biggest single chunk, yeah. Okay, so because you've really been aggressively growing other parts of the Yeah, country. they're getting to be less and less of a percentage, but they're still the largest. What's the next biggest? Um, probably uh, television. Mm -hmm. I mean, television, we have 35 series now on 24 networks. Um, 35 series currently on the air, so I think we've had like 72 series on the air. As of, so you're a producer? Uh, producer, owner. Um, so mm -hmm. we make, we, what we do in TV is we have everything from, we come up with the idea all the way to posting. We have, you know, 
I don't know, what do we have, four acres in Hollywood and, you know, 110 Avid Bays, they're, you know, 24-7 shifts. So if you go there anytime, there's just, you know, there's 20 hours of TV going out at night. So uh, proportionally, that's like half your movie? I mean... It's probably, uh, it'll get close to half sometime soon. It's probably about a quarter to half. And then you have also a gaming piece. You have a sports company. Our sports companies are doing really well. We're the largest sports agency in baseball, basketball, and football in the United States now, which is great. We is just, talent representation? Uh, we're bigger than CAA and bigger than... Um, Octagon and bigger than Wasserman. Um, that's great. We have about 400 clients, two and a half billion under under uh, uh, contract under management. Under contract. Um, and that's that's a pretty fairly new business for you, right? That's about. Well, I started. We started basketball in 2009 or eight, and that was really from the, the way we really do it is we try to start it from scratch, see if we can prove the thesis, and then if it works, we'll we'll build by What's the acquisition. Thesis? So the thesis there was really simple, which is. When you look at particularly baseball, basketball, football, there's nothing you really can do in a negotiation, meaning they're form agreements. You can't, the league won't change them. The league also guarantees them. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're getting them a dollar extra, a dollar, but an agent on that level is really just saying, fill in the number and fill in the name. Um, beyond that, you know, an agent's job is obviously to get them their endorsement of contracts and, you know, help them expand their careers. But up until now, because all the other agencies also are talent agencies, they're not allowed to own content. And so they can't actually say to you know a client, hey, we know you're a basketball player or a football player, and we're, we're sure you have aspirations of, you know, film, television, music. Mm -hmm. um, we can help you with that. They do say that, and the way it actually came up is they st they would call me and other people like me and say, hey, can you sit down with so and so and tell them you'll do the movies talent with agencies would, would sit, call us. Would, would you sit down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we just our first client was Amari. We had Amari Stoudemire coming here. I said we're starting this this ta this uh, sports agency, and here's what we're going to do differently. We're going to have very well-known talent. We're gonna we're gonna hire the best agents. We're gonna have the best marketing people. So we'll be able to get you contracts that are, you know, better or as good as anybody else. But because we own movies, because we own TV, because we own gaming, fashion, you know, we'll 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 be able to put you in it. And, we've okay. done, and so that so basketball. Forgive me, but I have not seen a basketball player in any of your movies. They've been in at least a dozen. Oh, they have. Mm -hmm. As I'm supporting, yeah, the, they, the, none like, of them are major act or, or major roles, but mm -hmm. you know they're also they have a full time career, so they can't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we just did this movie Blackbird that Amari's in. Not only that, he produced it; he was on set producing it. Um, we've got 11 TV shows around our our, our athletes. Mm -hmm. So what's happened is we've never had an athlete that's walked in here and said no to us um, because nobody else can really compete. Um, so. You know, from there, uh, the, that thesis was proven out. We, we became the biggest in basketball overnight. When I mean overnight, like over a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then we acquired a How baseball agency. How many agents agency. do you have? 27, 28. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so then we acquired f uh, football and we acquired baseball. And those grew pretty fast. So that's sports. And now you have aspirations in digital, big aspirations in digital, right? Yes. So you bid on Maker Studios. We hear you're bidding on full screen. That's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on there? Um, well, actually, so digital is two pieces for us. One um, spins off of a company we've been building called Madvine. So right, with Madison. the branded content. Yeah, well, okay. it's, it's branding, really. It's it's. I don't want to call it a new advertising agency, but that is effectively what it is. Um, you know, it's so it's where Madison meets Vine, and the concept there is that when we've been trying to build this for five years, and it somehow I think whatever the, the memo went around to all the CMOs of companies that said, okay, we can admit that TV advertising is broken now. Um, and so then everybody started going, oh, that's a good idea. Can we pick that discussion back up? But it's actually been this way for five years. So, you know, 85% of audiences TiVo today, right? That mm -hmm. means if you're a brand and you're spending a million dollars for a spot on Idol, you know, after you factor how many people that actually of that 15% left, how many are on their phones, how many are cooking, how many are talking. So what, they, they're talking to 100,000 people. So you got that, and then traditionally in the movie business, you know, even with us, someone like a Coke calls and says, "Hey, we'll give you 50 grand or 100 grand. Can so and so drink, you know, this in, on the in, show, you know, yeah. on the show for a second? And and then you're you're fighting with a director usually at a studio level, and the director doesn't want it. So we kind of said, listen, we can we have an answer to all those problems, which is let's pick a brand partner for each category of major branding. So Evian obviously is one of our partners for water. Um, as, you know, so for anything in the water category, whether it be film, TV, uh, uh, sports, digital, um, you know, uh, fashion, they're our partner. Um, you know, like completely to the point where we write them into scripts at script stage, mm -hmm. um, and they become our content partner. So we call it a content branded agency because they are the branding in all of our content that's water. Um, and then we built up a retail presence to help them. So the day, the second day we signed the contract with them. We got Fiji booted out of 7-Eleven, and we got um, Evian put in, which was about an $80 million account. How did you do that? 
Well, A, we've, we now have retail placement at 7-Eleven, Walmart, Kroger's, Rite Aid, Safeway. Um, I'm missing some. We're kind of considered to be the, the emerging category captain. So they're, they're actually in each one of those home bases. So we're always meeting with them about the products we represent. The films? No, the, the, the product. So like, for example, the Evian. You know, what we did is we said, we'll tell you what, if you sell the Evian here, we'll give you walk-on parts in movies through Evian. We'll give you athletes will show up here and sign. We'll give you, you know, um, signed scripts. You can come to the premiere. And so 7-Eleven has all this extra marketing now through Evian. So, and that passes through for all of our brands. So that started growing pretty fast and we recognized that one of the things that's, well, there's two things that happened. One, we've been in negotiations with multiple places to become and kind of launch our own digital platform. Mm -hmm. um, pretty well known places. And the idea being that since we control all of our movies, because we were one of the first to make our, the, our Netflix deal, the, um, the, uh, our deal does not preclude us from, we don't have to pull our movies off during Netflix window. So we're, we can sell unlimited on, which is why we also have such a big digital mm -hmm. electronic sell through. Because you don't have a window. Right, because we literally just can show it whenever we want. Huh. And because of the amount of, t of uh, content we're producing, and now because of the short form we have on our athletes and our fashion agency. Um, which is where, on YouTube? All over the place, wherever. Mm -hmm. we, we just put it out for fun. Um, we recognize we are a fully sustainable OTT. So we can have, you know, we have our, however number of movies. OTT. It's an over the top solution. Oh, so over like, the top, okay. Call it like a, a Netflix-like solution, except that Netflix started with just a bunch of other people's movies and now they have some original content. Mm -hmm. We'd go the other way. So we'd have all of our movies and then we have, you know, I don't know how many, 70 series that are, we've had on the air. We have 50 pilots that we've shot original. We have. So you want you want a network, you want an online network to put this content on? It will be where our, our content will be all be on this online network. Um, and so you don't need to own an online network to have your content. No, you're right. Online. You're right, but uh, we believe in asset value um, more mm -hmm. so than ne necessarily. Well, there's a question. Good. I mean, you know, these these uh, multi-channel networks are you know struggling in terms well, of their MCN's, business model. Well, MCN business models are broken. You know, I think. But yeah, you want to buy one. What, Yes, um, and as I said, as I said to a lot of people, I would buy one. I don't know how many other people can get the value that we can get out of buying one. Because you already mm -hmm. have the content. Because we own the content, we, mm -hmm. right? We have both the front end content and the, and the users who want it. Now, if you have a pipe in between that already has people that are watching a significant amount of, I'll just call it less than, less standard content. So mm -hmm. content that's been made by more kind of original users, obviously different type of, uh, not, not premium content. So we're tacking on a premium content. We're bringing our own users. The platform is already there. And then also now you have influencers. Pardon me, but the platform is YouTube. The platform's not full screen or well, maker. Well, it's like, it could, the, that's kind of arguing though, in my opinion, whether it's, you know, Comcast or ABC. I mean, you know, you're right. There's a platform here. I, if you said ABC is going to another, you know, I, and I have, if you happen to love ABC, I'm only using that as an example, or HBO, you know, it can go anywhere it wants once it establishes a brand. So I look at really YouTube as the very first and definitely not the last um, kind of cable or, or MSO for the the digital world. Um, so right now they're the only the, the only game in town. You go to YouTube and you have full screen or you have uh, Maker, or Maker or any of the others or Jeffries that you know any of those that are out there. But <clears throat> if you you know, if you build enough brand presence. So if we were the only places you could sign up and own, you know, and say, okay, I have movies 24 seven, I have 50 TV shows, I have original short form sports content and fashion. And all of a sudden you got comfortable with that and it said, oh, I'm no longer on YouTube. Or by the way, you can get it in a different form and higher quality over here. here. Mm -hmm. You're gonna do that. And so that's why I say we're but the only ones because Every other studio already has its own networks, right? But your intention then would be to have a multi-channel network just to promote your content, no, or you're going to charge, actually, you're actually going to monetize change, it. It's no longer going to be a multi-channel network. We would be monetizing it. We'd be converting it into a, into a actually, your own pay, that's exactly like, right. a big, like a pay channel. But, yeah, but I can go to YouTube today, look up an NBC show, pay two ninety nine. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in that case, you know, you, uh, you YouTube know. will take forty percent of the two ninety nine. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're also not building a loyal group of a loyal group. Basically, YouTube owns that client. So the purpose for full screen or the purpose for of, of maker, any of those, in my opinion, the value of those OTTs are that they actually know who the consumer is. They actually do own the consumer. They might be using. Um, uh, Another, YouTube a, a, a as a, a means of accessing mm -hmm. them, so they don't have to go rebuild it. But in my opinion, 
you know, the reason that Netflix has worked so well, obviously, is that they've offered something that nobody else has. And so people elected to go outside of a known environment. They offered streaming movies at any time, and then they started offering some original programming. So what we'll be able to offer is a lot of original programming. And I'm not talking about what full screen currently has or Maker currently has. And clearly that's... So you're not that interested in their content? I'm not interested in their content at all. I'm interested in the platform. And, and the truth is, if I wasn't planning on going public in the near term, I'd spend three years building it. But that's how long it's going to take to go build an audience of that magnitude. And so you, you weigh out the risk return profile. You say, OK, do I wait and spend three years and eventually have that, that value? Or if I spend x dollars today and then I go do an IPO, is that x dollars going to generate x times something if I put all these pieces together? You, you're planning on going public, but you're raising money now. Why are you raising money now? It's our pre-IPO round. What does that mean? Um, anytime you go public, you generally do a uh, pre-IPO round, which is basically make sure you've got a lot, a lot of cash on the balance sheet. When you go public, the more cash you have, the the better and more fondly the street looks at you. So, mm -hmm. you know, since you, for the first time when you're going public, you're broadly distributing your financials to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, if if someone shows that they have 150 million dollars in the bank, they're probably less intriguing than if they have 500 million dollars in the bank. Mm -hmm. So, because a you need you don't need the IPO. B you see that it's just a means to growth. So that's <clears throat> almost every company I know of. I mean, I had, a ch I had seven chances to buy Facebook stock, you know, five months before it went public. It, you know, some were discount, some were, I know. But literally, <laughs> I was like, well, you know, I probably thought the same way. Why are they selling stock if they're going to be so high? So, um, so that's it. And then also, we're in the middle of a couple, as you know, a couple acquisitions. You know, we really want to buy a digital platform um, before we go public. And we're in the middle of. Just because you feel like you need to have. Well, Every, that puts all the pieces. Three six, yes, one of the pieces. That's the piece of our 360 that's missing, and mm -hmm. we've been building it, but it's too small. Mm -hmm. Meaning, we can, we have, I don't know what our, we have on a comm score some great amazing number, but what we really want to do is own that audience, and not be going through third parties. Well, I think that that is probably one of the key things that you just said that I think is really interesting that Hollywood has still not quite figured out is how to how to eliminate the middleman between themselves as content producers and right. consumers, right? And that's what that's exactly the what new we're media, to do. yeah. That I think that's you know what was behind the purchase of Flickster and Fandango. Hundred yep. um, percent. And I don't know if that's turned out to be a good thing. I don't know that either of those, those have or, or haven't. But here's the thing: is that I don't think, and I, it's without sounding egotistical, I don't know anybody else that's in the position to do it. And here's what I mean by that: position to <laughs> to actually have the right amount of content to sustain its own platform that won't lose users, right? Any so. studio that has a library ha is in a position to do it. Yes. And, and I would argue that your library is very small to well, sustain that. Yes actually. and no, it depends. If you're talking about a movie channel, fine. But now you're talking about a premium movie channel, and you can get movies anywhere you want. So what I'm more talking about is uh, consumers like to binge view new, new stuff. That's just what they enjoy. Um, so you know, you go to any other studio, forget the library for a minute, because that library you can get anywhere else today. So just because they have a library, that's available on everything from Netflix to you know, Vudu to Hulu to wherever you want to go for it. And they're not going to leave because, oh, that company happens to be showing it versus the other 26 places it's already on. That ship is left. I mean, Emgo has it, for God's sakes. So for us, the reason I look at it is I say, OK, what do we have that's different? Well, we know that the studios and the television arms of that studio and the digital generally don't work together. We also know that they don't own any of these other pieces. So you, it's going to be hard pressed for you to find a studio who's going to say, we're willing to change our model and take our movies as soon as they come out and put them on something that we own only and not go out and start selling it and syndicating it to all these markets. We're also going to, it's going to be hard for them to go and say, okay, now we're going to go coordinate and work daily with our television you know, arm to do the same thing to, to program on well, new Well, I mean, TV Di shows. Disney does a very good job of coordinating across difference for, for, for a media giant. They Disney does do the best really of well. anybody. Yeah. But, okay, and, and I would say they still have some major issues there, but they do the best of anybody, which is one of the reasons I was surprised at their maker purchase because um, they've already, I think, maximized that audience. And I don't believe that the target audience who's on maker are people that are going, hey, I want to go see I Disney think stuff. that they're thinking that they've got ABC Family, which is that young audience, and they've got younger kids, right? In, right, and then they don't have like those millennials. I think right, but I think for. they don't have the content for the millennials, and you know, so I think that by owning that, they they don't, but they know how to make content, and they've got for kids. Well, I don't know if they've ever tried. Why right. do you want, why do you feel the need to go public? Um, why do you need? I that? don't. I so we don't want to go public as uh, just going public sake. The reason we want to go public is so we got we get to a level where 
you know, we've raised money um, consistently, which is a growing business, you always do, you know. Um, and we've, we've got to be very, uh, our earnings are great, our revenue is great. And frankly, going public doesn't sound to me all that exciting. Um, but to continue the growth that we know we can, we, can, we can achieve, meaning I still see a lot, and we still see a lot of opportunity in relative, you know, all over the industry to um, fix what's broken, to actually make the model better. But in order to move the needle, it's no longer about one of us saying, let's go try this with one person. We need to buy things. Otherwise, it's just not going to be meaningful given the size of the company now. And so there's a- So you need the cash? No, it's not the cash at all. It's the liquid currency. So when you go to acquire companies, let's say we want to buy a company for a billion or a billion and a half dollars. You want to give them the stock? amount of work that we, it takes for us to show them what our stock is worth, that's an extra two months. That's a lot of diligence. Right. That's a lot of you know, back and forth. And it, we, we have a, it's a little bit of a competitive advantage. I was going to say you can't compete in the, ma in like the maker deal. Well, in the maker deal, with we, your, well, we, we could have competed. And they wanted us to, frankly. Um, that was a little bit of a different story. But in like full screen, for example, we could compete if we want to. We're going to always end up paying a premium to what, so if I say, to okay. To what a public company would, would right. could offer. So if the public company says we're going to give you 400 million of public company stock, and I say, well, I think I'm just making a number. My stock's worth three, you know, $3 billion right. valuation. Prove it. They're going to say, prove it. Or by the way, you might have to give us 550, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so we end up paying more because it's an argument over value. Whereas we believe our value on a public market is even more than what we think it is today as a private company. Where do you see relativity 10 years from now? Um, hopefully I'm not working this hard. <laughs> uh, no, I think we'll, we'll be in the same spot. What I mean is I think we'll hopefully be um, continuing to innovate. We'll be looking at where the, the business is going, not where it's been. Um, and we're going to be looking, again, I think content isn't going away. It's, you know, content is what controls all this. So for us, it's we want to be at the forefront of delivering good content across all, all, all spectrums and platforms. And that's kind of what the whole company is built on is we don't see movies more important than TV or TV more important than digital or sports or fashion more important than gaming. It's all the same and we're all in a room together. So I can't tell you in 10 years, is gaming going to be bigger than, you know, fashion movies content or, than yeah. movie content? Mm -hmm. I just know we'll be there delivering it in the way that they want it. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Ryan Kavanaugh for being Thank here you. for our first mini grill interview. And that's a wrap.